Open your Bibles, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and uh, we're going to go through a few verses tonight, and forgive me, I'll, I'm going to be a little slow tonight just to, to help unfold some things, and uh, for the next few weeks, there's some things that are very plain, but I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to give it to you the way that the Lord has given these things to me. A lot of times when God places something on your heart, you know why. You, you may know the direction, but you don't always know what God's doing. But the one thing that I've learned is God gives us the truth, and we're never going to be able to share it unless God uh, is able to use us with the right spirit and the right delivery. You know, sometimes, of course, in preaching, I, just like others, can be loud, and I'm okay with loud, I'm okay with quiet, I'm okay with stuttering preachers, I'm okay with hacking preachers, I'm okay with very monotone preachers. I, I could care less. What I care is that they're sharing the Bible, and they're helping us grow. And what I see in our church over the last few weeks and months is that we've got a lot of good, precious people. And as a pastor, and I know on Wednesday night, not everybody's here that's on Sunday morning, but as a pastor, my desire is for us to be able to grow. Of course, we've seen a lot of growth on the Sunday nights, and uh, we've had the Bible studies and different things. And for that, I thank the Lord for that. But I must be honest, even in preaching, of course, we have folk that are here, but then the ladies are running well. But, and then even with our men over the last few weeks, of course, with me being back in the pulpit, that number has begun to decrease. And, and, you know, you never know what it is, but this is what I know. The answer to everything is, is not a feel good and not just a connection. The answer to everything is growth. And I believe if we grow, just like anything else, I mean, you know, uh, them babies, when they hold on that little pinky finger, you know, they're all cute, but eventually they can stand on their own and they can walk on their own. And that's the goal. That's the desire. So for the next few weeks, until the Lord says stop or do something different, or maybe till the Lord quits putting things on my heart, I know we'll probably go about six or seven weeks anyway, uh, unless the God says something different on a Wednesday night. We're really going to be addressing things that God has pushed up, put on my heart. There are topics that we're now becoming to be silent about, or better, let, better yet, let me say it this way, we're not necessarily preaching or teaching about, and the world is loud about it, and Christians are silent because we're scared to death. And the Bible says this, and this is my conviction in this, that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Bold as a lion. But the wicked flee when no man pursueth. And what that, what that verse means is this. It means that the, the wicked flee, they, they run, they, they are emotional, they're irrational because they're not standing or holding on to a truth. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Uh, if you ever notice a lion, yes, there's a roar, but a, a lion is usually very calm and very patient. And I believe when the Word of God is inside of us, and we know, watch me, every time the news comes on or something else, whether it be political or whether it be a, a new side of something that we see or something that happened or maybe something that somebody does in front of us or the ball field where somebody loses their marbles over something, the, the Christian ought to be able to hold their tongue and not dive into something trying to fix somebody because we know what the Bible says and we got to live what the Bible says and we got to have this sermon. And some of that is being led by the Spirit of God. So tonight, the first thing I want to start is, is really just principles. If you're going to take notes, you can write this down. We're going to talk about principles tonight that are proper practice. Principles that are for proper practice. And what I mean by that is, is how we grow. Uh, there's a lot to be able to grow and to be able to know and to be able to learn. But, but I, I want to be able to give you that I believe 100% in clarity that you find in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 through really chapter number 10. These are principles. And I say this all the time. I was talking to Brother Travis yesterday. Principles matters because here's what happens. When you, when you follow a personality, and a personality is all about a method. It's what they think, what they see, and all these other things in a mindset. And you can argue because one person says it's better than the next. But when you live by principles, principles never change. And I say this all the time, so please forgive me, but the principle of gravity is always the same. You could jump off this building, and no matter what, you're coming to the ground. 
You can lose weight and you can fast and do it for about two weeks and lose about 20 pounds. But when you jump off of this building, you are still coming to the ground. The principle of gravity never changes. You can jump off this building and you can flap your arms as hard as you want. You can run and jump off the building. But either way it comes, because of the principle of gravity, you are going to go down. So that shows us. The principles never change. So what matters above that is the principles that's found in the Word of God. And what I'm seeing today is every one of us, not some of us, but every one of us, we, we struggle. You know, Paul said it this way when he's in Philippians chapter number 3. He said, this one thing I do. And what he was saying is in this part of his life, he, he's not changing anything, Brother Jonathan. He's not trying to do something new. He's not living 10 steps ahead. He's not trying to go back and figure out what happened 10 steps behind. No, the reason he is is pressing forward and forgetting those things is because he is content living one step at a time. How do you do that? How do you succeed? How do you overcome a marriage that's struggling? How do you overcome a child that's struggling? How do you overcome a temptation or an addiction? By simply doing one thing, and that's living one step at a time. Paul said, this one thing I do. What is that one step? It are the six principles that I give you tonight. If we focus on these six things, I am 100% sure that you and I will succeed and overcome whatever we're facing. So tonight, when you look into it, let's just read one verse tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, we'll start reading. And uh, let's look at verse number 12. The Bible here is speaking about sexual sin, but I want you to understand what it starts off as it speaks. The Bible says, all things are lawful unto me. In other words, as we think about this topic, there, there's some things that are lawful. I, there's absolutes. And we're going to dive into that, but he says, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and, belly, and, for, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Now, when Paul comes to this place, I want you to know Paul begins to speak to immature Christians. Let me define, first of all, by teaching, preaching, what an immature Christian is. It's not an 8-year-old. It's not an 11-year-old. It's not a 21-year-old. It's not a 35-year-old. It's not a 47-year-old. It's not a 61-year-old or an 82-year-old. No, it's not defined by an age number. An immature Christian is somebody that has not grown up in the things of God and begin to add to their faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, and all the other things that we find in the book of Second Peter. So what the Bible talks about as a mature Christian, that means being perfect, becoming the person that God has created and called you to be. Watch me now. Not like the preacher, not like your friend, not what everybody else is just okay with. No. When you begin to live like Jesus and you become to be that purpose, that person, then now God is using you and you are a mature Christian. Now, watch me. This is why I say this. There's a lot of people that are in their 50s that the last step they took for God was when they got baptized and joined the church. And today they are still an immature Christian because they have not overcome any other hurdles. They've not learned how to forgive. They've not made any steps. They don't know the last thing God's told them to do. They don't know the last thing that God's ta told them to go. They don't know the last person God told them to be able to speak to. They've done absolutely nothing for God except sit there. They learned to walk, and when they learned to walk, they sat right down. They know they can walk. They can get up and walk. They've got the knowledge to walk. They've got the ability to walk. They ain't worried what nobody says because if they wanted to, they can walk. But they choose not to. Why? Because they can walk. Just like Christians. They know they're saved. They're certain they're saved. No matter what they do, they're going to be saved and they're going to heaven. So they choose to sit right down because they're saved and that's just what they're going to do. And that's an immature Christian. And then going back to the Bible, 2 Peter chapter, this is what the Bible says. He that doeth not these things, doeth what, Brother Jason? What the Scripture says. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temper. That adding is not add to your salvation. You can't add to your salvation. It's by faith. 
By faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. When you got saved, according to Ephesians chapter number 3, everything you needed, you got right there at that moment. Then what happens is by your submission to God, it expands the capacity. And as you can expand the capacity, then what happens is you're able to be able to learn things. And the more you learn, the more you get like Jesus and the less you get like you. Can I get an amen? Then we can then properly quote the verse. Now unto him that's, that's able to be able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now watch me now. The reason why we can't always claim that is because we ain't living so submitted to God that we're walking with God every single day, step by step. And when we ask God to do something, he ain't doing it. It's not because God can't. It's because you've never let God expand the capacity inside of you. And there's still just as much of you inside of you as the day you got saved. It's an immature Christian. So if we want to grow tonight, we got to do what the Bible says. And Paul is, is speaking to these immature Christians. Matter of fact, in chapter 3, he said this. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you, watch this now, as unto spiritual. In other words, I, I wanted to talk to you. I tried to tell you straight, but I just could not be spiritual with you. Why? Tell us why, Paul. But as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there among you envying and strife and divisions, and ye are not carnal, and walk as men. What he's saying is, you're still as babes in Christ. Now, going back to that text of 2 Peter chapter number 3, he says those that do not grow, those that do not grow from their salvation, all right, this is what the Bible says in the same chapter. That he forgetteth that he's been purged from his sins and he becomes to be blind. Do you know why? Watch me now. Do you know why people doubt their salvation? Do you know why sometimes you doubt your salvation? Do you know why sometimes I doubt my salvation in years past? Not anymore. Because when you stop growing, you start dying. And you begin to think, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to get to heaven because I'm not drawing closer to Jesus. Jesus. But according to the Bible, and we'll touch on this again, for the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That means you are saved, and once you're saved, you are always saved. So even when you quit growing, you do not lose your salvation, but you begin to doubt it. Everybody with me? Everybody all right? But then he says, you're blind. And I can't tell you how many people that I, I talk to on a regular basis, they're like, Brother Jason, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I can't see the next step. You want to know why? Because you quit growing. And when you start growing again, here's what God said. I'm going to help you see. I'm going to help you move forward. But until you do what God wants you to do, you're never going to get beyond where you are today. So he speaks to them and he tells them, you've got to apply these things. So let me give you to, to you these very quickly. These six principles. You ready? First of all, the principle of expediency. Expediency. That word is found there in verse number 12. Notice it, if you will. He says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Now, what do you mean by expediency, Brother Jason? What I mean by this is it's a principle, but it's a compound principle because it's found on twofold. If you notice in the text, there's two things that's brought to surface. The first thing is, is it lawful? What do you mean by lawful? Well, let me just put it this way. There's some things you don't have to pray about, and it's everything that the Bible says. People say, well, let me pray about it. Well, if the Bible says, you ain't got to pray about it. Ain't no such thing as praying about it. If the Bible says so, that's what the Bible says. You just do it. Can I get an amen? I mean, the Bible says you ought to forgive as God's, God has, for, uh, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You ain't got to pray about forgiving somebody. What you got to do is you got to die to self, and you got to choose to forgive as God, for uh, Christ's sake, has forgiven you. It's a choice. It's not a prayer. Everybody all right? You're yielding more to the old man and not to Christ in you. 
So you got to look at it. Is it lawful? So first of all, it's not about your opinion, my opinion. The first thing is, is it in the Bible? And if, it, if it's in the Bible and it's black and white, then it's always right. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. You know, a lot of times people always want to know when they're dating, when they're teenagers, and they're like, well, what's too much? You know, what's too much? Well, let me just say this. I'm not a saint and I'm not your example. I'm not trying to be silly by that. I'm being direct by that. I have a son. He's 18 years old. I can completely understand, but I just want to say this plain. Your example's not daddy. Your example's not your daddy holding your mama's hand. Your example's not the way that your daddy treats your mama, no. Your example is what the Bible says because the Bible says when it speaks about it in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Timothy, he says to be able to treat younger women as sisters. So therefore, unless you kiss your sister, you shouldn't be kissing your girlfriend. Everybody all right? Uh, unless you cuddle with your sister on the couch, you should not be cuddling with your girlfriend. No, don't get quiet on me. I mean, I, I'm not here to talk about my life. I'm here to, this is what the Bible says. Because at the end of the day, it's lawful. It's black or white. It's very easy. But where we've messed up, and I said we as parents, we've messed up. We've all chose to be able to say, well, you got to be easy. You remember where you was. You remember where you was. The last thing I checked, the Bible ain't about where I used to be. Somebody help me preach. And it might offend somebody, but it ain't going to hurt me to offend nobody as long as I ain't got to worry about the scars and the headache and all that other stuff. And if anybody else has ever dealt with that, you, you would stand up and shout hallelujah, amen, if you could. But you know those pains are real. So here's what I'm saying. The first thing is when you're thinking about expediency is this. You have to ask yourself the question, is it in the Bible? Because if it's in the Bible, that's it. There's no more discussion. The second thing that he brings to service notice is it expedient. What does expedient mean? It means you to be able to bring you towards a destination. To be able to draw you to something if you can. In other words, every decision or activity, it either moves you towards or away from Jesus Christ. So you have to say this. All right, first of all, if it's not, I like what Miss Alma Jean said to me one time. She said, there is no such thing as a gray area. It's either black or white. It's either sin or it's not sin. And I believe that 100%. So you have to ask yourself, well, if the Bible don't say thou shall not, then where do you look at it? When you live every day and it's not cut and dry, the first thing you don't do, let me tell you that, is you don't say, well, the Bible don't show me chapter and verse. How many, how many kids, don't raise your hand, how many kids say that? How many people say that? How many friends say that when you, when you speak to them about the truth that's in their life? Like, well, you can't show me in the Bible where it says that. Okay, well, then let's go with what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. It's not just what's lawful, it's whatsoever is expedient. And if it does not draw you closer to a destination, and that destination is Jesus Christ, then I hate to tell you it's not good for you, it is sin. Black and white. So when you look at it, you have to ask yourself this question. Is it bringing me closer to the Lord? Is it pleasing the Lord? Is it making me to be more like the Lord every single day? Because if it's not, and if it's not the Bible, then it is wrong. It's sin. So the first principle we must live by every day, you don't need a preacher, don't need a mom or dad, don't need a spouse to be around you. Whatsoever you do, you must remember this, the principle of expediency. It's not just a lawful thing, but it's also drawing you closer to God. It Watch me, I, and I'm preaching now. But this word that I speak, is it going to help me be more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Everybody all right? Second thing, write it down. The principle of enslavement. Notice what the Bible says, if you will, that same verse, we just read it. It says this, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Notice the words, to be brought under power. That means to be enslaved. And you understand that we were all slaves at one time. There's no question about that. So you got you to be able to understand that when you live your life, you, you are set free. You, you, you are no longer the one you used to be, but you're set free because you are in Christ. And it's amazing because it's just like Adam and Eve. You have all of these things you can have except for one tree. But you know the problem is because we refuse to be enslaved to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, re we refuse to take everything that God's given us for the one thing we can't have. 
But we must remember that He is our Master. He is our Savior. So that means every thought, every habit, every attitude, every activity, every pursuit, everything we have in our life, it must be honoring to our Heavenly Father. I belong to Him. Somebody help me right there. I belong to Him. So it's not about what people say. And I'll go as far to say this. It don't even matter what other people do. And it don't matter if it's Christians. If it don't line up with the Bible, then you do what the Bible says because the Bible's always right. So not only the principle of expediency, but the second thing is the principle of enslavement. Now, I want you to go now to chapter number 8, if you will. And I want you to talk about the principle of example. Example. I'm moving fast tonight, but you take these and go back and study it and they'll help you. We're going to read verses 8 through 13. And I'll probably skim most of it for a moment. But I want you to understand in context, the principle of example is you must first of all know that everything you do, it matters. Everything you do, it matters. Notice what the Bible says. Verse number 8. But meat commendeth not, uh, us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we not eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours be, uh, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, watch me now, for any man, if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not in conscience of, of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. And, though, and through the not thy knowledge shall the weak, uh, weak brother perish for whom Christ died. So in other words, you're thinking about the weaker brother. There's an issue about the meat that they're supposed to be eating. They're fighting about these things. He goes on, and notice what he says in verses 12 and 13, and we'll move on. He says, but when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin, sin against Christ. Notice the Bible says in verse number 13, wherefore? If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Here's what he's saying. He's dealing with a pagan society. And as he deals with it, what he's realizing is that God's people are in a position. And when he looks at this, it felt like God's people, they, should, they said that God's people should not eat this meat because it had been offered to the devils. So now everybody's saying, well, they shouldn't eat this meat. It offers to the devil. So they're battling over these things that's going on. And Paul just makes it plain. He said, I'm just going to be honest with you. If that meat, if that meat in your life, if it, if it was to come and it would not make you better, neither make you worse. However, he said, this is one thing I would do. If it's going to be a stumbling block to somebody else, it ain't about will it hurt me. Watch me now. The question you should be asking yourself before you justify your actions, Paul says, is not will it hurt me, will it hurt somebody else? Now, I want to ask you a question tonight. If somebody called you out about something that you weren't convicted about, and I don't have time to preach and explain to you what convictions are because it's abused today. But I will say this. A lot of people's convictions ain't my convictions. But according to this right here, Brother Randy Higgins, if my conviction's not your conviction and you look at me and your conviction is something that I'm doing and you say, Brother Jason, you shouldn't be going around and you shouldn't be buying those lottery tickets because the Bible says gambling. And the truth be told, you, nobody, this is a lie, I just want to say this. Truth be told, your past might be that you were a gambler so much that you wasted all your money and about lost your marriage. So therefore, if it's something said to me, instead of arguing with you, well, it ain't your right to judge me. Because I love Christ and that's what it takes not to make you stumble, I should put those things aside and say, to God be the glory, I'm with you and not against you. Now, that don't make what I'm doing wrong. That's what he's taught. It's the weaker brother. Now, can I go a little bit deeper? Let's talk about your marriage. If something's in your marriage and one person struggles but the other one don't, you never go above the weaker person. Hallelujah handy right there. Y'all help me. 
And you, okay, well, let me just get all in your tater patch, all right? Let's just say you like hanging out with everybody, but your wife ain't happy to be able to hang around with that one female. You can force her to hang around that one female, but you know what happens? You ain't getting no bread and biscuits in the morning. You ain't going to get no meat and taters tomorrow night. Somebody help me preach. You understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> What you do is you realize it's not about what I want. It's not about something's happening, honey. Ain't nothing happening. No, 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 no. Because you honor the Lord in your marriage, you're willing to give up whatever it is to put God first, to never be a stumbling block. Now, watch me now. Again, convictions. I'm not talking about things that are lawful. I'm not talking about things that are lawful. I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I'm under, I, I can't say this. It ain't no big deal. There are people right now that I know that when I, go, when I go to a football game, me and Charlie Riddle can go to a football game, we can tailgate. And we can tailgate out there, and there's people all around us, and, man, they're hooping and hollering, and they're drinking, and they're doing all kinds of stuff, and they're partying and doing all that other thing. And me and Charlie and whoever else goes with us, man, we have a good time. Number one, because Charlie always cooks crab legs. Somebody say amen. I mean, we got the best tailgate you've ever seen, all right? But there's people right now that I know that cannot be in that atmosphere because that's a strum stumbling block. And instead of being mad at them, we're not going to be like, bless God, you ought to be able to go. I can't believe you. You know what we got to do? We need to find an alternative because we are wrong if we force that brother or that sister to be in a situation where they're going to fall to temptation. And that's what it's talking about. Just be an example. So watch me now. What, what Expediency. Number two, an example. Uh, number three, understanding that you're coming to a place to where it's also about enslavement. I belong to God. Number four, write this down really quick. The principle of edification. I'm, I'm going to hurry. Chapter number 10, verse number 23. Let's read it together. Tell me what I need to live by, Brother Jason. The Bible says this. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So now it's talking about to edify. You ought to live by the principle of edification. In other words, edify means to build up. Everything you do, everything you say, everything whatsoever, it should never be tearing down anybody. It should always be building somebody up. How many of you know that this whole country would have revival if we would just live by that one principle? Just build everybody up. We're looking about tearing everybody down, making them upset. No, no just build some. Instead of looking at the negative, look at the positive in their life, all right? So to build them up, okay? Number five, write this down. The principle of exaltation. The principle of exaltation. Same chapter, chapter number 10, verse number 31. Let's read it together. The Bible says this, Wherefore, watch this now, whether, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, watch, do all to the glory of God. So in other words, everything you do in life, it ought to be for the glory of God. Everything you do, it reflects back to God. So that means your actions, your attitude, what you do, how you labor, how you handle a certain situation, everything you do, how you play a sport, uh, how you act at work, uh, how you sing, how you preach, how you teach, whatever you do, how you work the sound booth, everything you do, you do it for the glory of God. Now it's twofold. Number one, because he deserves the glory. And as long as you're trying to please him, everything's going to be all right. Somebody give me an amen right there. But the problem is it's twofold because when you try to please others, what you're going to realize real quick, look up here, ain't everybody going to always applaud you. And you're going to quit. So see, not only is this giving God glory, but also it's keeping you in the battle. Amen. And you know what we need, Dylan? We need more people staying in the battle. We need some soldiers of the, of the cross serving the Lord, saying, you know what, I ain't going nowhere. Why? Because what I'm doing, it ain't for Brother Travis to be my friend. It ain't for Brother Jacob, Miss Angie to be my friend. It ain't for everybody to know our name and for everybody to watch our YouTube channel. No, it ain't got nothing to do with that. It ain't for people to look at me at the end of church and say, boy, I, I sure do like you, you singing that song brother, better, better than Brother Aaron. It ain't about that. It's for the glory of God, right? It's for the glory of God. But the second part is, is when nobody applauds me and nobody recognizes me and nobody even pays attention to what I'm doing, I don't get so mully grubbed, poochy lipped, mule face, and quit. I realize what I'm doing is for him, not for everybody else. Lastly, tonight I'm done. Somebody comes to the piano. The last example I give you tonight is this, the principle of evangelism. Chapter number 10, verses number 32 and 33. These are just six principles. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, watch me now. I can't remember who said this, you know, uh, forgive me for kind of messing it up probably too, but he says, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Y'all have heard of that in your job, you heard that in your career, you heard it in sports, you've heard it in everything. Watch me now. It works in your Christian life too. 
If you don't get up in the start of your day and you set your feet in a direction, look at me, look at me. Your direction determines your destination. If you don't get out of bed walking with Jesus, you're going to stumble along the way. You're going to stumble either way it goes. But if you don't get out of bed and your feet saying, okay, Lord, I'm walking with you, then you're going to mess up. So what do you mean by evangelism? Notice this very quickly. The Bible says this, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but a profit of many, that they, what? they may be saved. As they begin to play on the piano, you come to this text, Paul's desire was he did not want to turn anybody off to the gospel by his lifestyle. Paul, Paul, said, Paul said this, Paul said, I, I don't care if there's any, anything that offends somebody in my life. I, I want to give it up because I am, that's how broken I am for people to see Jesus. Is, is that you tonight? I, I mean, are you really just willing to give up whatever? You know, I, I, as a pastor, there's been a lot of people that, man, I, I mean, there's been people I've chased out in the parking lot and apologized to, and I didn't mean to offend them, Brother Tony. But I cared so much about them that I realized that Jason Holly somehow offended them. I'm just, I'm just trying to do what God wants me to do, and I just offended them. But it mattered so much that I had to run after them. I had to seek them. I had to apologize and say, hey, I didn't mean it that way. Here's why. Because your soul, when you live it for God, matters more to me than anything else. And especially my pride, because my pride is a mess. Can I get an amen? It is. And you know, when we got a heart for people, we'll give up anything. When we got a heart for people, we'll let things go. Let me change this. Let me put it in perspective. When what we do, what we say, and how we act... When we do it in light of eternity every single moment, it'll change the way we live. You know, we shout, we say amen, and we be like, just like the month, other week talking about Noah on the boat. And we're like, yes, that's right. Get on the boat. Jesus is coming back. Two weeks ago, what's changed then? What's changed in my life? What's changed in your life? If we really believe that the flood is coming, it's more than an Amen. It's more than just, I agree. No, I'm talking about having a heart that's broken, that realizes that eternity is real, and the time is now. The time is now to forgive. The time is now to overlook. The time is now to submit yourself. The time now is to forfeit whatever you're holding on to that matters so much that all it's doing is causing a conflict and making everybody unhappy. When at the end of the day, people are dying and going to hell, leaving the church, People are looking for a reason to leave the church. And we're so, so bullheaded trying to hold on to certain things. I say we as an all in general, right? We just get so stubborn. It's like we just we can't let that go. Well, I promise you this. You let it go and you see them get born again. Man, it makes it worth all the while. How about this? You ain't got to get up and testify about it. How many times have it been like that in your marriage? I, can, I, can I just testify, Miss Cindy, I like sleeping in my bed. <coughs> yeah, I do. I like sleeping in my bed. I, 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 like, I like waking up and getting up in the morning and getting a good night's rest because my wife ain't been up all night slamming things around because she's upset with me trying to wake me up while I'm sleeping. Can I get an amen? I like it. I like it. So finally, I just got to get out of bed. So, all right, honey, I'm sorry. What's wrong? Life is so much more pleasant. I'm being silly, but I'm being serious, too, at the same time. Life is pleasant when you let things go. You're like, you know what? It wasn't even that big of a deal. I'm sorry. I apologize. And then you go right back to it. Why? Because that's what matters. I just encourage you tonight. Live by these six things. So, you mind the Lord. Stand your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Heavenly Father. Help us to grow. I, I know tonight is just, just listening. But Father, I pray that we'd apply these things. Maybe share them. But God, we not sit back and be passive. I thank for our church. 
Lord, bless now this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. She played just a moment. If you need to pray, just take a moment and I'll dismiss you. say this while she's playing and some of you's praying but let me tell you why all this matters so much because not only is it lawful if it's in the Bible you do it but we're living in a, in a society today where people who know the Bible are adding to the Bible and the reason why that matters is is because if it's not lawful people cannot push something on you so in other words, you, you need to grow because sometimes people have a good way of humiliating you and making you feel bad. And there's nothing that crosses me more. Like it, I'm passionate about Christians that need to grow. I mean, because I understand I'm growing every day. I mean, I, I, I've grown this week. But there ain't nothing that tests me any more than hearing a loud mouth Christian try to overtalk somebody because they know a little bit of Bible and they're making somebody feel dumb. And the truth be told, they're really speaking their conviction. A conviction is not a principle of the Word of God. A conviction is something given to you to be able to keep the conviction, I mean, keep the principle that's been given to you in the Word of God. You understand what I'm saying? Those convictions are personal. That don't mean everybody shares your same conviction. But what happens, they get up there and they say, well, this is what the Bible says. They take it out of context. And I'm going to tell you something. It matters because we got a lot of young Christians. I was going to say, we got a lot of young Christians at Haynes Baptist Church, and I thank God for it. I don't know if y'all ever do this, but if y'all ever want to, y'all get over there in the corner, y'all come up here, and y'all just watch the service. I mean, I, occur, I mean, you'd be surprised at all the things you see. Y'all laugh for a minute. I mean, I'm telling you, we got a lot going on. We could have a reality TV show right here in this church sometimes. I'm telling y'all. And y'all just sitting there like everything's all right. And me too. I'm like, hey, pay attention. Look up here. Right? But you know, that's the beauty of it. All of us are different, coming from a different walk of life. And it's all because of Jesus. We're here. Nobody's perfect. And by the way, we're all growing. Right?